morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, another Wednesday MNR. Um, today we have Chavi Garcia talking to us about uh, fundamentals of time series analysis for transfer function estimation. Many, many, many of you know Chavi, if, if not personally by reputation. He's a uh, well established uh, research scientist, currently senior research scientist at uh, Institute of Marine Sciences in C6 since 2009. Um, he's got a long CV. Uh, he's spent time, of course, did his PhD in Barcelona, and then he spent time at Woods Hole, and he came to a geological survey and spent time with me. Um, and then after that, he spent more time at Woods Hole, and then he spent time with me in, in Dublin, in Dias, when he finally was able to get away from both me and Alan Chafe and Rob Evans uh, and got to a position in Barcelona. Um, and so we're going to hear from Chavi now. Uh, just to remind you what's coming up next week, we have uh, a special webinar from Ken Witherly <clears throat> on a reflection on copper porphyry exploration. And, and Ken's been a wonderful advocate for magnetotellurics. Um, so that's a really good one to listen to. He'll also introduce a little bit of career aspects. He'll talk about life in the industry. Uh, and then the following day or the day after, depending on your time zone, we've got this very special discussion event that's co-sponsored with the uh, British uh, Columbia Geophysical Society. It's at uh, half past midnight on the 11th, so that's the afternoon, evening in the Americas. It's in the morning in Asia, and unfortunately, it's the middle of the night in Europe. Um, and there will, you'll see there, there'll be four people who are experts in the world who'll be talking about this particular issue of uh, tandemanium. Uh, and then the last uh, MNR of the year will be Hao Dong giving us an overview of the wonderful uh, Chinese National uh, MT program. So just a reminder that all these webinars are up on the uh, uh, webinar page. I've actually changed the name of the page. It's now MNRs, MNRs.h. TML, and there you can see registration links and video links and past present presentations. And here, for example, you can see this uh, BCGS special event. So you're now in a, a webinar, which is a little bit different from a, um, a Zoom meeting, if you're more familiar with Zoom meetings. You have a chat function and you can send a message on your, on your chat function uh, to either the, those of us who are panelists, and panelists today are myself and Max Mockamp and uh, the presenter, uh, Chubby Garcia. And then the, we have a Q&A box and you can send questions in your Q&A and um, Chavi, if he has time, he will answer those on the fly. Otherwise he'll save the Q&A until the end. So I'll stop sharing now and invite uh, Chavi to share your screen and uh, put your video on so I don't see your face. Here I am. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, well, thanks, Alan, for inviting me to uh, to give this uh, seminar. It's a uh, it is a pleasure. And um, one thing I wanted to say is that um, I mean, it, it is not a a done deal. Uh, I'm sure I forgot a lot of uh, references and uh, techniques and and things. So sorry for that. I think I try to gather what for me was probably the most important. So I hope you enjoy this and uh, you get um, as excited as, as me about uh, um, the fundamentals of time series uh, processing. Okay, so what is the fundamental problem? When we go to the field and we collect the electric and magnetic fields um, to uh, obtain the electrical impedance that describes the subsurface conductivity structure, the only problem is that this data contains source signal and noise. So um, here on the on the bottom uh, right, we have this cartoon that I really like. I took it from a, an old talk by uh, by Alan uh, Jones, um, in which we see the the input of the um, the magnetic uh, fields are inputting in the, the system in in this filter, which will be the earth and is represented by the impedance the trans, uh, tensor, and the output channels it will be the electric field. The only problem is that we don't measure 
those, we measure um, the fields plus the noise, where it would be these uh, this, um, fields with the wiggle on top. So this is what I'm, I, I divided my, my seminar in these uh, four aspects, I think is uh, what they, what I would like to, to do when, when I process data, is the, the scheme that I follow. So for pre-processing, I think this is a, is a very important step. And this reminds me um, when I was doing my PhD and uh, I had the opportunity to go to Woods Hole to work with Alan Chafe uh, and learn about data processing. One of the first things he did he was he pulled me in front of a computer, turned on MATLAB, and he said, try to visualize the data is, is the first thing I was like, I want to learn about processing and he said first you have to look at the data and I think that was the, the key and it's one of the most important things you can do. So here we have a, an example of a some time series on the top uh, we have the two electric fields and in the bottom the two magnetics and the, we can see in the electric field in the top one uh, that it has a little uh, jump and a little trend towards the end and the rest of the channels they have some spikes in this sense, um, there are a couple of papers that recommend looking at the, at the time series and doing a selection. Um, uh, the paper of Garcia et al. in 99, what we did is we end up using only daytime um, segments to process our data. And in the case of uh, Ute Beckman et al. in 2005, this is a little bit different because the selection was done in the spectral domain and it was based on the um, polarization ellipses and uh, trying to, to gather uh, the optimum uh, events that will improve the responses. So there are several data conditioners that uh, we can use to improve our data. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the motion induction noise that uh, primarily uh, affects the marine magnetotelluric uh, uh, data, So, but uh, today I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm going to look at the at the rest of the of these conditioners the first one if we start in um, in chronological order would be the delay line uh, filters uh, especially the first one that it was proposed by Schneck and Fisher in 1980 is the delay by one it's a very simple is this simple equation and this is a very crude uh, low pass filter uh, later, uh, Heinrich Rasse in 1993, in his uh, PhD thesis, he used a similar technique, but in this case, it was the 16 2 -third hertz and 50 hertz to remove, to remove um, power line harmonics, and I, I think also um, train, um, train noise. And uh, we can see in this image uh, the before and after uh, this, uh, uh, this, this filtering. We have to remember that these uh, delay line uh, filters are uh, finite impulse response filters. And of course, uh, on the left, we have the, the transfer function, the, the definition, and these filters, they have an amplitude and a phase. And that's something we have to uh, take into account. Another popular uh, filter, especially some years ago, it were, they were the, the notch filters, especially to remove power line harmonics. And we have the, the transfer function and on the, on the right, we have a cartoon showing uh, more or less the, how this uh, filter works. You know, the, the main, what is the definition of these uh, parameters. Um, with the advent of uh, modern electronics and uh, better systems, now most of, uh, of the magnetotelluric uh, systems, they include a notch filter. So I haven't, um, I don't recall seeing many papers lately talking about uh, uh, people applying notch filters to the data. Alan Chafe, uh, since uh, I will say the, the, the earliest of his uh, processing codes, he always advocated for the, uh, an autoregression filter to remove the trend, um, to do a widening of the, uh, of the spectra. And uh, just to, to show what is this, uh, this trend, uh, I show an example of uh, some mean stock value, that it will be the, the red plot, uh, the red wiggles on, in this plot. And uh, we can see the, the blue line will be the trend, uh, the orange will be the seasonal um, variation. And finally, the green is the residual, which is uh, the information that uh, economists are looking for. So the, the blue line will be what it would be the, the trend, but there is a lot of information that can be extracted from, uh, from the time series, information or noise, depending on uh, uh, how we're looking at it. 
Another interesting technique for uh, uh, denoising, it was uh, proposed by Trad and Travasos in uh, 2000. Their hypothesis is that noise and signal can be separated at different scales. So by using a Dovechi's um, wavelet um, transform, what they did is they separated the, the time series in uh, different uh, scales and they removed the scales that based on Thomson weights were uh, containing most of the of the noisy segments and we can see in this plot uh, the original um, well uh, not the original time series but the, the power of the original time series and the power of uh, the noise time series and we can see how those spikes have disappeared and on the right we can see the signal plus the noise uh, the signal in the middle and uh, and the noise and we can see how beautifully um, this technique work in this case Another uh, interesting technique for, uh, for selecting um, these um, less energetic events and that, um, that um, could be uh, troublesome because in, in the case of, uh, of Johnson Spratt 2002, they were trying to select um, those segments that were not affected by the, by the, uh, the activity of the aurora. And uh, they suggested using the analytic signal uh, uh, applied to the magnetic fields, estimate this ratio between the uh, vertical magnetic field and the horizontal fields based on uh, the standard deviation, selected some segments, and finally process the data. It was a quantitative uh, step over the, uh, the selection of uh, daytime or nighttime data. Uh, more recently, Kay uh, et al. in 2018 have suggested using the uh, EMD, which is uh, the empirical mode decomposition, to uh, eliminate the, uh, the trend from the time series. And uh, I'm going to talk later about the empirical mode decomposition, so I'm not going to go into many details now, but uh, we can see on the left, we have on the top the signal. It can be decomposed in, uh, on these uh, IMFs, and we can see the last one that is um, branded residual, uh, which contains the, uh, the, the component of the time series that cannot be decomposed uh, furthermore. And in this case, is the, is the trend. And we can see how um, when it's removed, we obtain uh, the, the signal, the, the field, without the, this trend. And uh, finally, I would like to talk about this um, data variance technique for uh, the spiking that was proposed by Kepler in uh, uh, 2012. Um, this technique is, uh, is also very interesting. It's uh, first thing what the author does is that he selects some clean segments in his uh, time series and then train with the help of a, of a remote reference. And uh, these clean segments train a Wiener filter so, and obtains the, the, the parameters for this uh, VNR filter. After that, uh, he locates the noisy sections, predicts the signal on these uh, noisy sections using the uh, VNR filter and the remote reference, reconstruct the signal and process it. On the right, we see um, a time series, uh, well, the, the, the response of a time series is uh, the, the red line. Um, this data was uh, contaminated by the by the author, and uh, those are the the blue uh, the blue dots, and we can see that they are all over the place and uh, very noisy. And after the spiking, he can more or less, and it's, it's quite good what uh, what the method can do to recover the original signal. The second step in uh, data processing is uh, the spectral estimation, and for this. Um, is, uh, I would like to quote Prieto Tal, and it is desirable to be able to obtain a reasonable spectrum with uh, little or no bias and small uncertainties. This is very important. So as a note to everybody, um, we have to remember that uh, we have the uncertainty principle. So we cannot have a very uh, detailed um, resolution in, in the time domain without uh, increasing the resolution in, or, or decreasing the resolution in the frequency domain and, and, uh, and the other way around. So we always, um, as we squeeze 
the, the resolution in, the, in, the, in one of the domains is going to increase in the other one. So we're going to have this uncertainty and there is no way around. The only thing we can do is try to explore better methods that offer better, uh, what it would be the optimum um, solution at, at each, uh, at each um, time and frequency uh, cell that we're going to uh, be interested in, uh, in studying. So the first, uh, I'm going to talk about the Fourier techniques, and I divide them in uh, conventional methods and non-conventional methods. The conventional methods is uh, pretty much what everybody um, has been using uh, traditionally, which is the short time Fourier transform, in which we have the time series multiplied by this uh, W, which is a, a sliding window. And uh, depending on the, on the length of this window and how it's designed, uh, we're going to obtain um, the, the, the spectra at certain frequencies, and we're gonna construct our uh, spectra from this. For the non-conventional methods, I would like to um, just mention this uh, cascade decimation that was suggested by White and Bostic in 1979. And this is a very important method because back then uh, computers were, um, well, a total luxury and they didn't have the power that they have these days. And uh, so this uh, technique started, you know, with a selection of uh, segments, which can be of uh, 32, 64, or 128 points. We precondition this each one of these um, segments with a Hanning window, use the discrete Fourier transform to estimate the spectra, and select only the sixth and the eighth harmonic from uh, from this spectra. After that, we low pass the data, decimate by two, and we start all over. So then we're gonna construct. Um, really similarly as the short time Fourier transform, we're going to construct the whole um, spectrum of, uh, of our time series. One important aspect of, uh, of uh, Fourier methods is that we are required, we have to remember we need to use a window or a taper. And uh, this is to reduce the spectral leakage and bias caused by uh, limited time series or by uh, spectral peaks. Uh, for single windows, um, where you can go into Wikipedia and you'll find lots of information and lots uh, of uh, these windows that are shown in there. So I'm not going to go into them. Um, I, wanna, I would like to mention the multi taper methods. Uh, these are based on the discrete prolate spectral sequences. And this is probably the best way of uh, estimating your, uh, your spectra. And uh, I think Alan Chafe is going to talk soon. He's going to be, uh, gonna be uh, giving a, an webinar about this. The only thing I'm going to show are some of these windows and, um, and their um, spectra to uh, show how uh, good or bad uh, they can be for protection. So on the, on the left, we have the, this uh, single window uh, from top to bottom, we have rectangular, 20% uh, cosine, 50% cosine, and finally the Hanning window. And we can see in the uh, in the spectra, how good they are at offering pro, uh, protection uh, for uh, for leakage and or how bad they are, especially the the rectangular. Uh, it would be a really poor window to use. On the right, we have the discrete prolate uh, sequences, and these are single windows, so it wouldn't be uh, multi taper. And uh, we can see how, especially for the longer um, longer um, waveforms, uh, we have uh, better protection. So the second technique I'm going to talk about uh, today about um, uh, how to obtain the, the spectra of the time series is the wavelet uh, uh, transform. And this was uh, suggested uh, by Cassie and Jones in 2008. Um, the problem that we faced then was that the AMT signal, which is the global line in these charges, uh, which create a plane wave that travels in the ionosphere as surface cavity. but um, these waves, um, the, the, or, or this, this signal is not uh, constant. It, it comes in spurts in, the, in, the, in our time series. And we can see it in this, uh, in this plot. Uh, here we have this time series of 0 0.025 seconds showing the magnetic field and electric field from Northern Canada. And we can see as the recording starts, it's a very little signal, it's almost nothing. And then suddenly towards the middle of the window, uh, we have this uh, huge event and more energetic, uh, larger uh, amplitudes. And then the, uh, 
the amplitude reduces again and pretty much we have nothing. And uh, these wiggles, that uh, this, uh, this uh, high energetic uh, section, this is one of these, um, is a lining that happens somewhere in the world and travel and arrive to our station. So if we look at the, uh, at the spectra of uh, this time series, and remember the blue are low amplitudes and red represent high amplitudes of, uh, of the spectra. What we can see is that even when we get uh, this, uh, this event, is uh, not a guarantee that we're gonna have signal. And, uh, and here we have um, what it would be, this, this dead zone uh, of low amplitude is the AMD dead band. The uh, electric field in the bottom also shows uh, a minimum in the in the dead band, although it's not as uh, critical as uh, in the, for the magnetic fields. But uh, um, Garcia and Jones in 2008 suggested the use of the wavelet transform, and the goal was uh, to locate high energy events. So how to find these events and uh, best the, uh, and then only process this uh, this data. So the, the continuous wave transform um, allows for, um, you know, when we vary the parameters, allow for a time frequency trade-off in precision. So what we were talking before um, is a, uh, in our case, we think that it was uh, much better to use than the Fourier transform. And it's very similar to the, to the Fourier uh, transform in the sense that uh, we can use uh, sine waves and, uh, um, of different uh, different frequencies, so we just uh, changing this uh, uh, the the uh, the wavelet. Uh, we can uh, study different frequencies, and to make a family, the only we only will have to change the, the frequency of uh, the sine wave. So the the, uh, the wavelet that we use was the Morley wavelet of all the uh, family of the continuous wavelet uh, transforms that. We uh, we study. Uh, this was because uh, in, in this plot we have the uh, the uh, the wavelet, and it's very similar to uh, the signal that we get in uh, AMT when we have an arrival of one of these uh, uh, lining uh, strokes, and um, it was uh, the one that could represent better this uh, uh, this signal, and it's. On the left, we have uh, the equation for this uh, for this Morley wavelet. As you can see, is is simply a, a sinusoid uh, multiplied by a Gaussian window. And the most important, and the reason why we use the continuous wavelet transform, is that um, we have a direct uh, equation that we can obtain the period from the scale. So on the on the right side we see the spectrum of the Morley wavelet, and we can see as we increase the um, the scale and um, the window slides in the spectral domain, you know, on the on the frequencies. So we can uh, uh, be studying different um, aspects of the uh, of the spectrum. So before going into the next uh, into the next uh, method. I would like to talk about the stationarity of the magnetotelluric time series. And there are a couple of, uh, of uh, publications that um, came out recently and that I would like to, um, to mention here. One is a work by Uman and Rakoff in 2007 about lining discharges. And they, uh, they categorize the lining discharges as fast and transient. Uh, uh, leader return stroke sequences, slow and quasi-stationary continuum currents, and finally perturbation and surges on the continuum currents. These last ones uh, are the ones that, because they are the, the, the ones that they are longer standing and uh, uh, more usual, are the ones that uh, they pretty much made for, uh, for the AMD uh, source. And they might be viewed as uh, stationary on a section with some dynamic length confined by the recurrent transient strokes. And finally, the work of uh, Liu and Fujimoto in 2011, which uh, mentioned that uh, magnetospheric current is nonlinear driven by the solar, uh, dynamic solar wind, but behaves in a static manner for high magnetospheric pressure conditions. So, 
this um, means that uh, EM sources are naturally uh, non-stationary since both uh, lightning strokes and magnetospheric pressure conditions are very dynamic and thus strictly limit, limit the duration of any stationary electromagnetic signal. Um, so basically, uh, the conditions under which um, these, the source is stationary are, um, it can happen, but uh, in a lot of times, in order, uh, um, um, what we measure, uh, it may be um, not uh, truly stationary, and um, we will consider that as a noise. In addition, noise sources do not need to be stationary, and this was reported by Adam et al. in 1986, and they have a station near a road, and every time a car went by, uh, they, could see, uh, they could see the noise, and they uh, concluded that the uh, that the the uh, the noise was uh, not stationary. So our proposal was to try a tool that does not assume a stationarity of the time series. For this, we uh, we use the multi empirical mode decomposition, uh, MEMD for short. It is a database that does not make any assumptions on data stationarity. It's based on the Hilbert Huang transform is a multivariate version of uh, EMD, which I uh, just mentioned earlier. And it decomposes the time series into intrinsic mode functions or IMFs. And one, each one of these IMF is a time series with a dynamic and locally narrow banded uh, instantaneous frequency. Offers a great time frequency localization, although it's, you remember, you always are uh, bounded by the uh, uncertainty principle. But there is always a but. It suffers from high sensitivity to uh, signal to noise ratio. And finally, uh, EMD and uh, uh, MEMD spectra are equivalent to the Fourier spectra. So um, it was a, um, it was a, a nice tool to try. Um, so I'm going to show some an example of uh, some deeper data from uh, a LEMI instrument uh, was measured in Natal in northeastern Brazil, and I'm just going to show 3,600 points of uh, this data. And uh, here we have the three channels in different colors. Here we have the IMFs, um, each one of the columns for each uh, for the, the channels, and uh, as we can see, the the shorter or the, the top IMFs um, correspond to what it would be higher frequencies, there are more uh, um, rapid uh, variations. And as we move down to longer IMFs, we can see how the, the, the wiggles represent uh, the, longer, uh, the longer periods. Uh, another thing is, which is nice about the, um, this multivariate version of the EMD is that uh, you can see that across um, these IMFs, you can see the similarity in the wiggles in uh, across the channels, and that's something that uh, um, that is uh, uh, promoted by the uh, by this um, multivariate version of uh, of uh, EMD. So we can reconstruct the signal if we simply add all these IMFs plus the uh, residual we obtain the, the signal. On the right, we have the difference between this uh, uh, signal um, and the reconstructed. And I don't know if you can see it, but the, the uh, differences is uh, smaller than one to uh, minus 15, which is uh, just numerical error. In the bottom, we have the signal without the residue, where it will be the signal without uh, this uh, trend, although for 3,600 points, I don't know, you, you can see that much of a trend. And the, uh, these residuals are on the top left um, that we interpreted as uh, for this short time series, we interpreted as a, as a, as a trend, although it's, it's not, it's, uh, I wouldn't say that it's real trend. So another problem we, uh, you, we well, not a problem, but uh, a challenge you face, you know, when you decompose the data into IMFs is like how you extract the signal and the frequency from, from these uh, IMFs. And using EMD, uh, Chen and Jagen in 2008, this, uh, this is a, the, probably the seminar 
uh, work on uh, the initial um, uh, work on uh, on using uh, the EMD and magnetotellurics, and they suggest to use the margin the marginal spectra for each IMF. Later on, uh, Chen et al. in 2012, and using uh, the work of uh, Juan et al. in uh, in 2008, they they find the instantaneous frequency in all the channels, but uh, keep in mind that they were using EMD, so they had to they had to find this uh, these instantaneous frequencies in uh, in all the channels and uh, making use of the multivariate version of the EMD, uh, Neukirchen Garcia in 2014, uh, and using a similar strategy as uh, Chen et al. in 2012, what uh, we uh, proposed was uh, this scheme that we have on the on the right side is uh, here it looks uh, very complex, but um, it is better explained in the in the uh, in the manuscript in the paper, um, and it worked quite well. So the third step in uh, in data processing is the impedance estimation, and uh, so once we have transformed the time series into the spectral domain, we need to solve um, the magnetotelluric equation. The electric fields are equal to the impedance times the uh, the magnetic fields, and so we're gonna you so we're going to solve these uh, using uh, ordinary least squares or ls and uh, so we're going to convert it into a linear regression model there is the, the second equation that we have here with epsilon indicating the uh, the errors or the residual and uh, finally we need to solve the objective function s and in the case of uh, ols is the uh, is what we have in the bottom this uh, is the norm of the electric field minus the, the magnetic field times the impedance. So by, uh, to solve this equation, what we do is uh, we multiply on the left side by the uh, Hermitian transform. That's what the, the super index T uh, indicates uh, of the magnetic field and uh, uh, passing this uh, uh, first term to the right side, we isolate the impedance and we have uh, this equation. Um, it's very simple, but the problem is that uh, in, in, an, in this case, Z is correlated with, uh, with the residuals, with the errors, epsilon, and therefore um, OLS is uh, inconsistent. So for this, uh, Gamble et al. in 1979 um, proposed the remote reference uh, method. Although I just have to uh, remind you that this method is in the, in the general uh, literature is, in, is known as instrumental variables method. And uh, just remind you this because um, there are more references out there to instrumental variables method than to remote reference. So if you want to look for uh, literature. And uh, initially and since then, most people have used uh, the magnetic fields as, uh, as remote references. And this is because they suffer less noise than the electric ones and also less affected by local inhomogeneities. In reality, if uh, you look at this uh, instrumental variables method, they have three requirements. The first one is that the number of remote reference has to be equal or larger than independent variables. Uh, for magnetotelluric, the independent variables are the two local magnetic fields. So that means that the number of remote reference have to be larger or equal than two. The second condition is that the remote reference references must be ex exogenous or valid, and that means that the covariance between the remote references and the uh, the error, the residual, has to be zero. And the third condition is that the remote reference must be relevant, and this means that it must be correlated to each one of the endogenous regressors, um, so to the to the local magnetic fields. The way of uh, solving this uh, problem, the remote reference problem in, in the general case, is through a two-stage least squares. I think uh, Alan uh, mentioned it like this in uh, his uh, later um, publications. And uh, first, what you, know, you, uh, you need to do is uh, to solve uh, to solve this uh, remote reference problem is, is do a regression, solve a regression between the local channels and uh, the local magnetic channels and the remotes, which will be the first uh, stage. 
and then substituting is, is this uh, first equation that we have here, and then substituting these predicted uh, magnetic values back in the, into the normal equation in uh, that it would be the second stage. And considering that the uh, remotes um, are not correlated to the local noise, uh, we can obtain uh, the, the following equations. Um, we define this uh, matrix H um, R, which is uh, similar to the hat matrix, although it doesn't have the same properties as a projection uh, matrix. Um, so we obtain this uh, B uh, brief magnetic field, which is the projection of the local magnetic field um, using uh, the remote references. And finally, um, through some algebra, we can obtain the, the formula for the uh, remote reference impedance, uh, which is in the, in the bottom. And here, I would like to include this uh, warning by that was uh, um, mentioned by Chafan Thompson in 1989. The remote reference method can help in empty data processing, but it's not robust. And in the, of, in the presence of a severe contamination, which will violate the condition number, number two of, uh, of the uh, requirements for the, for the remote reference method or uncorrelated channels, which violates the condition number three, it will fail at providing uh, reliable responses. And here I highlighted the, the, the term robust and is, um, what I'm gonna jump into now is uh, um, um, since uh, probably since since the advent of the uh, of the remote reference method, one of the uh, techniques that has been um, more widely used and and probably the best uh, uh, one of the best solutions that we have for uh, improving our uh, responses have been the introduction of uh, robust least squares. And robust in the sense that they identify and remove or damp the effect of uh, outliers to make the estimate insensitive to the presence. And so that means that they are not affected, uh, that the, the, the responses are, or the, the system is not affected by the outliers and responds slowly to the addition of uh, more data. This method was introduced by Hoover in the late 60s and in Magnetotelluric, the first uh, reported. Uh, use of uh, these methods was by Johnson Jodicke in uh, 1984 and late, later in uh, Ebera Mucker in 1986 and Chafe et al. in 1987 uh, used the M estimator, which is uh, uh, these are iterative related least squares. And posteriorly, uh, Larsen in 1989 uh, also used it in his uh, D plus time series even picking uh, software. So I'm gonna talk about these uh, iterative related least squares because it's um, probably one of the, um, the most important uh, algorithms for uh, robust processing. So is first uh, remind or recall that uh, um, the ordinary least squares minimizes uh, uh, this uh, function S. And now we're gonna uh, have to minimize this uh, this equation here in uh, the second equation in which we introduce a new function f. Uh, but the way of solving this, it has to be uh, iteratively. So at any step t plus one, we see that now we introduce a weight function that it depends on the previous uh, solution. So the solution from the previous step. In matrix form and uh, we are not considering any remote reference for now. It's only single site uh, processing. The equation um, comes to be like this, where this uh, omega, or sometimes this, uh, I also write it W, uh, is a diagonal matrix containing the robust weights. So this iterative weighted uh, least squares is used to find the maximum likelihood of a generalized linear model or what is the same to find an M estimator that minimizes the effect of outliers. For MT, the solution will be, uh, so we have for any step T plus one, we have the, the, um, the top uh, equation with uh, on, the, on the right side, we have the matrix uh, expression. And remember in this case, I, I call it um, the, the weights are the capital W. 
And uh, for the initial step, the the preview the weights always start with a with a one. And as we go iterating, um, we have to use this uh, this uh, formula in which uh, rho is is the weight function that uh, we're gonna choose. And now I'm gonna talk about these uh, weight functions, and only gonna talk about three, probably the ones that they are more used in uh, in MT. The first one is the ordinary least squares, which is a particular case of the uh, iterative reweighted least squares, believe it or not. Uh, in this case, the weights are always one. So there is only one iteration. And as you can see here, um, this is the, 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 the plot uh, is very simple and it treats uh, the same uh, outliers or data. The second function is the, is the Hubert's uh, T uh, function, and we have the expression in this uh, formula in which the, there is a key parameter called uh, name T. And this T, um, where it represents is, uh, uh, it, it limits um, the size of the uh, residuals. So residuals that are smaller uh, than, than T or minus T, uh, uh, they'll, they'll get weight uh, by one. So They'll, they'll, they'll go through. So small residuals uh, will go through. And residuals which are larger uh, than t or smaller than minus t, uh, we can see how they get um, damp or uh, underweighted. The value of t, um, most of the literature that I found, um, they use a value of uh, 1.345. Uh, but Alan Chaif likes to do 1.5. I think that the reason of using this is because of uh, what's coming now, which is the uh, the Thomson wave function, which is very severe, as we can see. Well, this, this uh, expression on the top um, that we can see that is uh, this uh, uh, complex multiplication of uh, exponentials, and we see that is very strict and uh, the flat uh, bar in which the the data or the the residuals uh, don't get uh, downweighted is very narrow and it tapers um, down to zero very quickly. So um, Alan likes to do a few iterations of the uh, of the Hoover weights to direct the minimum solution to uh, uh, to somewhere nearby, and then uh, finally use uh, a few iterations of the Thomson weights to uh, to limit even more the uh, and the solution of the, of the least squares. The uh, key parameter in, in this case is this uh, she uh, function, which uh, uh, Chase and Thompson, um, they, they found that the expression, the true log uh, 2n, where n is the nth uh, quantile of the Raleigh distribution. And like always, the, at the first iteration, the weights um, have to be zero, uh, have to be one, sorry. So can we combine this uh, iterative reweighted least squares and the remote reference? So as a reminder, the two equations for the impedance for the uh, iterative and the remote reference. And again, through um, some algebra, and uh, you can find it in the literature or even uh, in some of the, of the publications of Alan Chafe, you can see the derivation. Uh, we obtain the, the equations that they are in the bottom. Um, the uh, in in this case now we have this b brief um, that um, will be on the on the right side uh, on the left side um, and the expression uh, is uh, is in the bottom which is the local magnetic fields projected uh, by the use of the of the remote references so another um, key component of uh, of a regression is and, and you probably read it in the publications by Alan Chafe is the, the terms of uh, leverage and influence. And I think these, uh, these cartoons um, are much better to show what is uh, leverage and, uh, and uh, influence than the simple uh, definition. So here we have a bunch of uh, cloud of uh, random data and uh, the blue line would be uh, the fit and it's pretty much a, a straight uh, flat line. And we, uh, we select a point, which is originally in the zero, zero uh, 
uh, coordinates, and uh, that's on the on the top left. If we uh, move to the uh, bottom left, um, we move this point along the uh, ordinate axis, and we can see that uh, this uh, point doesn't have any effect on the on the fit. Uh, the curve stays pretty much the same, and this point would be considered an outlier that has um, very little leverage and no influence. On the on the top right, we have uh, the same point. Now we move it uh, along the the abscissa to the to the right and slightly to the along the the ordinate to the to the top, and we can see that this point uh, is starting to move the uh, the curve uh, upward, and this will be a point of uh, high leverage. If we move this point farther up. Uh, then what we obtain is a, a high leverage, high influence uh, point. So uh, there are several ways of uh, minimizing the, the effect of uh, leverage and uh, influence in regression. For leverage, Alan Chafe and uh, pretty much uh, everything that I found in the literature, they suggest the use of uh, weights based on the diagonal of the hat matrix. And for the influence, there are several uh, techniques that you can find out uh, in the internet. They're um, very complicated to apply because uh, those techniques, um, they always assume that you have not much data. You have a lot of data. They are very complex uh, because what you have to do is remove one point from the, from, uh, from the, from the, uh, from the set, calculate uh, the, uh, the, the estimates and remove another point and, and so on and uh, and see how uh, the the removal of each one of these points um, affect the, the final solution um, so you, this is how you will find the the influence um, which is a um, computational um, very demanding uh, process Alan Chafe uh, uh, since uh, since he uh, presented his uh, his code uh, the bounded influence remote reference uh, processing the BIRP, um, he suggested that he, at each of the iterations of the iterative weighted least squares, he can calculate uh, the influence of uh, of the residuals and. Uh, uh, by using some some weights, down weight, and those residuals that have uh, larger influence. And that's after uh, eliminating already the points of uh, high leverage in the magnetic uh, in the magnetic field. So, what about uh, PCA? And uh, this is uh, work uh, has been done by Gary Epper, Maxime Smirnov, and more recently. Um, uh, Mike and myself also in, in 2014. So Gary Ebert in 1997 showed that the uh, magnetotelluric sources are well described by two electromagnetic field polarizations. So that means that the entire data uh, vector space of all channels in a data set can be represented by the combination of two polarization vectors. The only thing we need to do is find the two principal components that better represent the source. The only problem is always the, the, the bad, uh, is that the fields are a combination of signal and noise. And uh, for this, Gary Ebert originally uh, suggested to use a multivariate multi-site approach, um, which also um, was, uh, has been used by Maxime Sunov and uh, uh, Mike Neukirch and myself we use uh, uh, what is called robust PCA, and, and we didn't enter too much into this uh, multivariate uh, approach. So um, I'm going to explain how this uh, PCA works by showing an example. And here we have a cloud of, uh, of points. So it's uh, pretty much points along a line in which I added some, uh, some random noise, and we estimate uh, first the regression of uh, of i against uh, um, we have the slope uh, c and uh, the independent variable x uh, plus the intercept m 
and then we and, and it will be that will be the the feed uh, that we uh, show here with the with the red line, and we can also do the uh, the same exercise, but in this case uh, using uh, or regressing uh, the regressing x against the uh, the y component, and uh, well, we we obtain also and a slope and an intercept. And we can see that both curves are, um, are separated, what it means that they are biased. And the problem is that when we do the, the red problem, the, the, the question that we have on the, on the top, what we're minimizing is the, the direction, um, so the, the distance from each point to this curve only in the vertical direction. Well, uh, when we uh, regressing or doing the, the second problem, the, the, the blue line, what we minimizing is the distance in the horizontal direction. So that's the reason why we obtained uh, two solutions. So if we use uh, a PCA uh, regression, so for this, uh, initially, we need to scale the input variables because the PCA is a scale uh, um, uh, uh, dependent. We estimate the covariance. We uh, estimate the singular value of the composition and this covariance, choose the largest uh, eigenvalue, and predict y or x for each one of these, uh, of these problems. What we obtain is uh, two curves again. They are in black. Um, I didn't change the colors because they are uh, uh, coincidental. Uh, there is uh, no bias in this. And the reason why uh, this is happening is because the PCA estimates the distance in per uh, perpendicular to, to the line. So it will be independent if you solve the, the problem, the red problem or, or the blue problem. In this case, if I show the, the true curve, um, it seems that the red problem did better than the PCA, but uh, I think this, is, uh, it, this was just a random fluke because uh, um, I can run this program uh, thousands of times and it, the PCA will be closer to the true solution than the, than the uh, ordinary least squares. So the last step in uh, data processing is the uncertainty estimation. And, and there are two methods, uh, the parametric and the non-parametric. Hoover in 1967 already uh, suggested that uh, the, the, the regression problem, um, as the, the robust uh, least squares are asymptotically normal, only valid. Uh, but uh, the problem is that this is only valid for a large number of regressors. And uh, this is the solution if you use any package. I don't know if you use uh, Python. There are uh, hundreds of uh, packages that can do robust processing. And they provide some, uh, some um, uh, confidence levels or errors or variance or covariance. Um, and, and this is based um, pretty much on, on this uh, uh, asymptotic uh, hypothesis. Chafe and Lesaeta in 2002 uh, suggested that the apparent resistivities follow a non-central chi-square with a two degrees of freedom distribution, while the faces follow a short tail Gaussian. And then uh, the, the non-parametric methods, I'm gonna uh, explain a little bit uh, the jackknife and the bootstrap, starting with the jackknife. Um, so we have uh, the X, uh, let's uh, define it as an independent sample of a size n. And she uh, is a statistical parameter that uses the estimator uh, set. So we have this, uh, this equation. And we're going to create groups of n minus 1 samples. So what we're going to do is always leave one of the samples out, but we're going to do uh, n groups uh, different. We're going to estimate the, the variance for uh, each one of them. Um, for in, in the example that we have in the bottom, uh, and then uh, to, to estimate the variance of the whole population, uh, the jackknife uh, variance of the whole population, we will follow this, uh, this equation. For the bootstrap, we do the same. Um, we have the same independent sample and the same statistical parameter and estimator. 
But in this case, we're going to use k groups of m samples. And these m samples are chosen randomly with replacement from the, from the original set. And uh, to estimate the variance, the, the equation is very similar to the jackknife, but uh, right now we, we have k instead of n. So use of uh, non-parametric methods in uh, MT and the jackknife has been used uh, by Alan Chafe in uh, pretty much all his codes. Uh, in BIRP, uh, there is a, a slight variation of the jackknife uh, equation and it's because uh, Chef and Thompson realized that the, um, because the, the impedance depends uh, on, two, um, on two input channels, which are the magnetic uh, local fields, um, there might be some bias in the, uh, in, in the jackknife uh, um, variances. So, um, and it has been a suggestion that the um, weighting them by the uh, by the diagonal of the hat matrix cancel for uh, this bias. In the case of a bootstrap um, that I know is uh, um, the only code that uses it is uh, EMT by uh, Norky and, uh, and Garcia and is uh, the bottom equation. I think uh, in 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 our case k was equal to thousand. We did several tests and uh, we uh, we determined the thousand was a uh, an optimum number for most uh, methodologic uh, examples that we we face. So some final notes. Um, always, always, always look at the data. Uh, there are plenty of freely available robust processing codes. So there is absolutely no excuse not to use and an robust processing codes or uh, to <laughs> Uh, to, to process data not using uh, um, robust code. Um, and there are also um, lots of developments in time series analysis and regression. Uh, I already show a few um, that they were very novel, very strange, like the, um, the, the MEMD or the wavelet transform when they came out. Uh, they were pretty much uh, revolutions, but they're already uh, getting old. And there are new techniques out there. And the same for the regression with the boom of uh, big data and, uh, and machine learning. Uh, there are a lot of aspects that, uh, we, can, uh, that we can study. And, and there is a lot of uh, room for improvement. So uh, I would like to uh, encourage you to, to continue the work that we all been doing. And well, that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, I already have one question, but if you have any more questions, I'd be glad to answer, answer them now, or maybe you can send me an email and uh, I'll try to find some time to, to answer them. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Javi. And thanks, I'm sure from uh, the, all the uh, people who are viewing, we've got um, over 90 people at peak. I'm very, very pleased that you you emphasize looking at the data. I mean, I think these days I'm finding that um, students, uh, they're not even looking at the response functions. They just process things and throw them into 3D inversion code. So looking at the time series is, is super important. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Alan, um, yeah, I agree with you. And uh, um, I mean, don't get me wrong, if you have to if you go to the field and you come back with uh, 300 stations, um, looking at all the time series, it can be um, time consuming. Uh, and a lot of times what we do, and even I do it, is uh, you process all the data, mm -hmm. you look at the curves, and then you find that maybe 25%, 30%, 1%, 50%, they are very noisy. And those are the ones that you really, you know, they need some, uh, some TLC, you know, so you yeah, really have exactly. to exactly go to those and, and spend more time. Um, yeah, I think, and yeah, it's, it's not like uh, when I started my PhD that we were going to the field and after two weeks, we came back with uh, 10 stations and, you know, we can, we could spend all the time in the world to looking at those time series. Nowadays, we just, it's, it's industrial, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Well, let's get to questions. You, you have a number of questions there. The first one is from uh, Chandrasekhar. 
Um, I'm, I'm sending each question live as you're answering it. Um, yeah, um, I'm looking at it in the wavelet analysis of broadband MT data. I'm facing the aliasing problem at larger scales of wavelet. Um, how do I solve this problem? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Is um, I already uh, I remember uh, in when I use the the wavelet uh, transform. Now it's, it's all coming back to me. Um, uh, I was asked the same question when I presented the results in uh, in the workshop in Barcelona, um, and, and the the solution was that I never process long period data. Um, I always concentrated in in the in processing the the uh, the dead band, the AMD dead band. And if you recall in uh, in my paper, um, the longer periods. Um, gets worse with the uh, using the wavelet transform that using the BIRP. BIRP was doing a much better job than uh, than the wavelet transform. I never analyzed that because for me it was um, only a tool to obtain the best um, the, the best responses at the at the AMD dead band. So um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'll, we'll have to go back into into the wavelet analysis. I don't know. Uh, if I can help you with this, sorry. <laughs> so the next question is by uh, Sayed Mohammad Abtahi. Then uh, the noise is a secondary EM field. How is it possible that primary fields are stationary and secondary fields are non-stationary? Um, well, the primary field. If we understand primary field as the source, the source can be totally stationary and the noise can be non-stationary. Um, so I, I don't understand this question. Um, the next question, um, using least square solution means that you assume that noise has a Gaussian distribution. Uh, this is not true in practice if the signal and noise are not independent. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, the the least squares have, uh, have their own uh, requirements. I didn't, uh, talk about those and um, through all the processing, you know, looking at the data, um, obtaining the best uh, spectra uh, and then using remote references to, to uh, remove bias and even the, the robust processing. With all this, what, what you, the goal at the end is that your, your data is, uh, is, is as Gaussian as, as possible. Um, so you can use uh, these tools. Um, at the end of the day, you have to deal with what you have. Um, um, so, and that's why the fourth step in, in my talk today was the, the uncertainty analysis. And that's what is gonna tell you um, how well fitted is, uh, is your data. And it's, I think it's as important that, the fourth step than synthetic analysis as any of the other three. Uh, the next question, why not using L1 norm instead of the L2 norm as in the least square solution? L1 norm gives a robust estimate anyway. Um, yeah, uh, you can try it. Um, I tried different things. Uh, even even uh, lately I've have been uh, playing a little bit with Bayesian uh, methods and at the end of the day I'm getting the same pretty much the same result so um, I don't know I don't know what to say about this um, it's something it, it's, 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 as I said you know I encourage you and uh, and, and and go ahead uh, what advantages do robust transfer functions calculation have of the, the least squares method for estimating magnetic transfer function? My guess is that least square assumes Gaussian error distribution and therefore sensitive uh, to a layer. Um, yeah, and well, as uh, the, the whole the, the whole talk was um, about how to minimize the effect of uh, outliers and noise. Uh, we're dealing with a real world. Sometimes we have to go get data in uh, very noisy environments, and uh, and and that's what we have. And um, so we have to uh, use all the tools that we have and uh, and do the best. And um, I mean, I, I don't. Uh, 
and the the well, and if you mean that the robust transfer function is um, the the if you refer to the least squares as the ordinary least squares, um, that um, is is totally is 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 not very appropriate. Uh, I know that your um, your data is uh, always uh, noisy, but uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, it has improved uh, through all these years that uh, robust methods, and there are several examples um, that um, we have to use robust methods. Um, so uh, I don't see why continuing the discussion uh, or discussion uh, on on using ordinary least squares. Uh, is it possible to choose uh, the position of remote reference at a place that has different geology from the measurement area? Uh, absolutely. Um, is it, it doesn't uh, the geology doesn't have anything to do with the uh, with the uh, the choice of the, or the choose of the of the uh, of the remote reference. Um, in that sense, uh, I remember years ago, uh, Don Watts from uh, Geosystem uh, called me up and he wanted to, to put some uh, remote reference for AMT measurements in, in the Balearic Islands uh, for some study that he was doing in Northern Italy, which uh, they have a lot of uh, noise. So I can tell you that um, there is a whole uh, basin with uh, several huge islands in the middle. Um, so the geology, of uh, Northern Italy it doesn't have anything to do with the geology of the Balearic Islands and, um, and, and it worked well. Um, the only problem is that at certain distance, so if, if you want to use an AMD uh, remote reference from Canada for some data from Northern Italy, you're probably going to have some uh, issues. Uh, for long period, uh, I use um, data from uh, from observatory is very far away. And I think Alan also can, can attest to that, uh, uh, the, the use of uh, um, remote um, data from observatories from the other side of the wall for long periods is, is uh, I don't see any issue, so. Yeah, I guess just to jump in, Xavi, the mm -hmm. stuff we did in um, South Africa, we were using a remote that was 1,350 kilometers away. Yeah. So for broadband MT, you can use distant remotes. It's a totally different geology, as long as you've got correlated signal between yeah, the local yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's, remember the three conditions, you know, the, uh, um, the remote reference have to be larger or equal than two. The second one is that the noise cannot be uh, correlated. So the, the noise that the remotes measure locally cannot be uh, correlated to the, your local noise, and that's, Alan, you remember in South Africa we had uh, the problem with the uh, with the diamond mines and the train lines, and even the remote references at 100 kilometers were affected by the same noise, so they were totally useless. So, what processing techniques implemented in Phoenix uh, processing software? Um, I think this is a question for Alan. <laughs> it's, I think it's Alan and Jodike. Um, yeah, no, the, uh, processing uh, the, code. The, the basic uh, processing is the white embossed cascade decimation, and it includes a robust aspect which is based on the Jones and Yodica least trim squares. Uh, by looking at time series, you mean is it possible to find the noises just during looking at them? Um, I don't think you're going to you're gonna find the noise, but sometimes you, you can find, uh, I don't know, spikes, or um, especially it's something that happens uh, all the time. You know, you are in the field, you set up your station, you turn it on, but you're, and then you, you start picking up all your instruments and loading the car and you leave. And so the first minute, they're gonna have a lot of noise. And then on the last day you come with the car, you try to park as close as you can from, uh, from the instruments. So you don't have to, carry them and the same until you stop the station there is a lot of noise so simple things like removing those uh, segments or uh, i mean if you have like a couple of uh, spikes 
most robust processing codes can deal with that. It will be a problem. Sometimes, um, like I seen it, um, uh, I have an, an instrument from uh, from Brazil, and the, the responses were really noisy. When I look at, uh, I try to reprocess, changing parameters, all these things. It wasn't working. When I look at the data, I realized that at some point during the uh, the middle of the uh, of the uh, of the recording, uh, it rained. The ground was very soft, and the uh, the magnetic um, uh, instrument uh, tilted. It was a Lenny instrument, and the magnetic instrument tilted, and it totally changed. And you could see in the time series uh, the change in the three channels. So. By removing this last section, the moment that uh, that instrument uh, tilted because the, the 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 ground was softer with the water and and it moved the instrument, um, I could process the the beginning. I didn't have very long periods, but at least I had some some curve. So um, I'm not saying that you're gonna remove all the noise, but you can help. So you mentioned a number of robust processing techniques uh, from your experience. Which one works better than the other? Oh, um, I will say that uh, my favorite is Burp <laughs> by far, and and I have a lot of uh, even even my processing codes. Um, I think the best is is Burp. Um, for AMT, uh, uh, Burp also provides a really good. Uh, responses. Um, my code um, needed a lot of work, a lot of uh, tweaking. The the wavelet processing code and uh, is uh, and is currently um, well. It's, it's, it's not. It, it doesn't work because back then I use a lot of uh, uh, I, I use an old computer and a lot of the libraries were uh, sixteen bit and uh, it, it will require a lot of. Uh, uh, reworking and um, since then we also move to other techniques. Um, the only uh, issue that I will say with the uh, multi empirical mode decomposition is that it takes a very long time to do the the, the decomposition. So and and you need a, a quite a good computer with uh, a lot of power. But uh, as I said, you know, at the end of the day, you're dealing uh, with uh, real data. For the most part, I would say that 75% uh, of your data is good. So uh, you can process it quickly with a uh, burp. And then those data that they are, uh, those data sets that are more noisy, uh, maybe you can try uh, something else. Um, maybe um, the EMT code of uh, uh, Mike and myself, or the new one that uh, one of these days I'm gonna publish and uh, I'll make it available. Um, Gary Ebert's code is also really good. I haven't used it in a while. Um, I think the last time I used it was in 2012. Um, but it's I find it so complicated, uh, so complicated to 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 get all the data in and out. Uh, it's very complex, and there are not many uh, tools to help you to uh, to uh, to get the data. Uh, going into the system, so is is the only issue that I have with uh, with uh, Gary's uh, code. Can fractal and multifractal analysis methods applicable and give results in MT time series analysis? Um, um, maybe um, I never use it myself. I never look at it. Um, maybe I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Something may want to try and uh, and see if um, if it helps. Uh, the next email uh, L one is non differentiable in the origin. I think you might need to be careful with the gradients when using optimization of algorithms. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. As as I said, um, the uh, um, I tried different. Uh, techniques for uh, for processing and uh, at the end of the day, um, even uh, the, the the weight functions, you know, there are uh, several. Uh, if you use uh, in my latest code, I use uh, Python, and you have access to all these libraries. And uh, besides um, besides Hoover and uh, and 
and uh, and other uh, weight functions that there are also several that you can use and is pretty much there is uh, no difference i think uh, even uh, alan chaves uh, I, I try uh, to test the code uh, just uh, stopping the uh, the processing before getting into the the thumbs and weights and um, and it does a pretty good job um, I mean, there is some advantage of using those uh, those weight functions, but um, yeah, it's, it's at the end of the day you have to try it and see and see how it goes. Is it possible to remove the noise adequately without using a remote reference, especially if the noise is correlated with signal? Well. Um, eh, in the case you don't have a remote reference, I seen um, some techniques uh, uh, lately. Uh, I mean, it haven't been published yet. Uh, I'm also a, an editor of uh, geophysics, and uh, so I seen some techniques that show some some advantages. Um, but this is uh, this is tough. Uh, I will say in general no, uh, but. Um, you're gonna need something else, some information, because um, if, if you don't have some uh, extra information, I don't know how you can remove that noise, you know. Um, how we can find the data processing step has not done good. I mean, is it obvious in the following steps, um, like static analysis? Well, in general, um yeah i mean this this <laughs> i find this question interesting um the obvious answer is like if the processing code um or the processing step didn't work you're gonna find um you know wiggles and uh, your data or your responses are gonna be wild and out of the place and you won't be able to to get anything out of them but in a lot of cases and and that reminds me the the paper uh, our paper uh, in 99 in the in the aural zone and also the paper of um, uh, alan jones with uh, jessica spratt uh, i don't remember the year i think it's 2002 or 2008 um, uh, in, in that case the data the, the responses if you choose um, all the data the responses will be smooth so you will think that um, that that the processing code uh, worked really well the only problem is that um, your earth is going to be more conductive or the lithosphere is going to be uh, thinner so it's, it's going to be giving you a different um, a totally different uh, uh, model so um, how you can find the the processing step <laughs> is is uh, it can be difficult to say in uh, in some in some cases yeah So the next question, Teleska applied the multifractal analysis on empty data and interpreted the differences in the estimation um, apparent resistivity at different sites. I can send you his paper. Um, yeah, I was uh, I was in touch with uh, with uh, Luciano uh, years ago, and uh, we were supposed to to do something. At the end, it didn't, it, we didn't do anything. Um, yeah, well, thank you. Um, Thank you. You want to send me this? Uh, I'll look at it and uh, and, and see. Uh, can the weighting function be defined by using artificial neural networks uh, models to define less noisy segments? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, as I said, um, one of the the papers that I've been reviewing or, or handling as an editor uh, recently, uh, they were using uh, artificial uh, neural network, and it seemed to to work well so yeah as, as i said you know, there, are, there are millions of uh, new techniques and uh, uh, um, as i said this is go ahead try them uh, is is when i have time is what i do is i try new techniques and think if i can improve so i think that's it alan uh, those were all the questions oh no there's another one oh <laughs> 
Well, great, Xavi. That's absolutely wonderful. And it's clear there's been a lot of interest in the audience. And I'm sure once I'll put the, the, the video will be up um, within an hour or something. And so I'm sure people will watch this again and again because that, that was very dense. It was certainly, <laughs> fortunately, yeah. I'm quite familiar with a lot of the stuff. So I was able to keep up. It really was very dense. Yeah, I know, and uh, and I try to make it uh, simple, uh, and I, I I left a lot of things out, yeah. and and as I said, you know, I could be talking about this for days and days. Uh, is is super interesting, is and it's challenging. It's very challenging if you have the right data set that you know you can test and and go testing your codes and all those things. Um, is is yeah, you you get into it and and. and <laughs> And, and it's like hitting a wall, you know, yeah. trying to to how you how you obtain something out of this uh, noisy data. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Chavi. Let me just uh, get this the screen back um, from you. Uh, <coughs> oh, wait, there, there is another question. Uh, I have seen some empty data where the determinant and averages differs very much at certain periods. What can be the reasons for this? I don't understand this question. Where the determinant and averages? I don't know. I, th I think that means the determinant average and the um, arithmetic average, and that's just really a statement about the uh, diagonal elements, whether they're uh, large or not. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so basically the answer to that is how 3D the world is. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. nothing to do with processing. Ah, here is the, yeah, uh, yeah. the multi taper spectral analysis. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> that is going to be uh, really interesting. Yeah, so just to follow up on Chavi's uh, talk was an intro, and then we'll, we'll get in, in deep, in depth with uh, Alan Chave who's uh, going to be presenting uh, the first talk in the new year on a multi-taper spectral analysis. <clears throat> and then after that, we'll have a talk from Joel Jensen on natural sourcing and methods for mineral exploration. So just to remind you, we'll, we'll see you all next week at uh, three o'clock. And I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Like I say, we had over 90 people at peak and I'd seriously like to thank Xavi Absolutely wonderful talk. So thanks, everybody, and um, see you next week. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.